it's important to remember our motivation probably probably best before the meditation but anytime it's good to remember motivation um, thinking about um, why we're doing this wanting to improve our minds become more compassionate and wise people so that we can help others and you know meditation has many layers to it oftentimes we just sit and calm the mind and focus on the breathing which is temporarily suppresses the mental afflictions that create karma you know our anger and depression and pride and jealousy and greed and desire and whatever um, you know just just calming the mind lessens the potency of all those um, but eventually you know when we come out of meditation you know we really haven't fundamentally changed the landscape of the mind we're still we still have the latent seeds of these afflictions in our mind you know we can temporarily calm them but you know, to really work towards liberation and enlightenment and, you know, or even in a, in a more ecumenical context, um, just being kinder people and happier people in, in the world. We need to work on emotional transformation and, you know, in a spiritual Buddhist context, we need to cultivate wisdom which has many layers. So all of these different topics, you know, that I've presented over the last eight weeks, you know, in, in the long rim, one way to do meditation is first to calm the mind, practice the breathing meditation, and then to turn your awareness towards one of these topics and think about it. Use, use analy analytical reasoning, make it relevant to your life with examples and think about, you know, what, what does karma mean in my life or refuge or, you know, rebirth, suffering, just, you know, thinking about these so that we develop kind of a certainty that starts to inform our daily life in, in, a, in a more consistent way rather than just, you know, kind of by chance. And then eventually, you know, so those are all what are called the method side of the path, you know, developing these tools to transform our mind. But then eventually we start to have to crack the really essential nut of the Buddhist teachings, which is, you know, who are we? How do we create this karma? How can I unravel this? How can I eliminate the ignorance that doesn't understand the nature of the self. And, and so I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but just during the meditation, you know, we're focusing on the breath. After a while, once the, the mind is a little bit calm, maybe try practicing stepping back a little bit and just posing a very gentle question that doesn't completely take you out of your quiet state of mind, but like, you know, who am I? And and who is this who is this person who's observing the breath you know you start to gain a little bit of distance from that solid sense of an eye you know as you're observing the breath you know you're asking who who is who is this person what is this mind that's observing is it something solid and and just kind of widening your field of awareness. Getting back to today's uh, topic in the long rim. Uh, so last week we talked about the three forms of suffering, the Four Noble Truths and the Six Delusions. So the 12 links of dependent arising or dependent origination is another way of thinking about the process of cyclic existence is how sentient beings create the karma, which keeps us trapped in suffering, circling around between the God realms and the hell realms, never finding any lasting happiness. So the 12 links is a kind of a, is a difficult topic. It's not one of my strongest um, areas of practice. 
and um, but I'll just do my best to give a brief summary. Um, I mean, whenever I read about it, I really find it quite interesting, and and it and it's um, as I'll talk about it. Uh, dependent arising goes really deep into the teachings on emptiness, and and so it's um, it's really useful um, to study these teachings. Um, this, this book right here, uh, I don't know if you can see that. No, you can't see it. Uh, anyways, never mind. It's not trained to look at books. <laughs> um, so it's called uh, Buddhism, One, One Teacher of Many Traditions um, by the Dalai Lama and Tukton Chodron. And, and it's got a really good section on the 12 links of dependent arising. Um, and I have several copies here. <laughs> so we need to slow down and start to take a look at how every moment we're creating karma based on delusions and how that leads to taking birth in samsara over and over again. And, you know, we take birth again and that fuels the creation of more karma and more suffering. And so that's, in a nutshell, that's that 12 links right there. So in order to be free, we need to make a really strong resolve to stop our journey on this wheel and understand how, how we're creating the wheel in our own mind. So um, there's a Tibetan word or phrase called nge jung, and it's often translated as renunciation, uh, but that can lead to misinterpretations. In the literal translation of nge jung is def definite arising or emergence. And it signifies this very strong determination to free the mind from sar samsara and achieve liberation, which is the focus of the middle scope Lam Rim teachings. So the basic principle of dependent arising is stated by Buddha in the sutras. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. I mean, it sounds kind of like really mundane and almost nonsensical, but it's actually quite profound because, um, you know, both from an individual perspective, but also from a societal perspective, it makes clear that our situation is never fixed and we can always change, um, change things, you know, uh, we can, we have unlimited potential and so does, so does the world, you know, uh, it, it just depends on conditionality and, and changing the conditions, both, both the inner and outer conditions um, but beginning with the inner conditions. Um, so when Buddha achieved enlightenment under, under the Bodhi tree about 2,500 years ago, the sutras described how he recounted his own journey through the 12 links by looking at the links in reverse order in order to understand the causal process from that perspective. It's also important to meditate in the forward order as well, but for now, I'm just gonna follow the reverse order, which is um, the same as presented in the book I just mentioned, Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions. Uh, so the 12th link is aging and death. We haven't experienced aging yet, but it's definitely approaching with each passing moment. Aging is the process of decline, which uh, begins in the second moment after conception, as soon as we are born, we begin to age and death follows as a natural course. Birth is the 11th link. It's the moment when the sperm, the egg, and the consciousness of the bardo being come together in the womb. In Tibetan cultures, at least one's age is measured from the moment of conception not from the day that the baby emerges from its mother. Um, everywhere in the world, people celebrate birthdays and the arrival of new babies. 
So it really puzzled me when I was living in a monastery one summer, when the abbot told me that Buddhist monastics don't celebrate birth, at least not in the way normal people celebrate it, because they understand where it leads, um, which is uh, to death. And, um, you know, of course, it's a social custom to rejoice when a healthy baby is born into a loving family. And it's a way to strengthen family and community and friendship. But um, we often don't think about the consequences of being born into samsara under the influence of delusion and karma and all the sadness and pain that we inevitably experience. Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about this, it just, I just always hope that people aren't defeated or discouraged by that journey and somehow they can find the teachings on liberation, which leads out of that suffering. So what is the cause of birth? The 10th link is becoming or renewed existence. And it represents the fully potentialized state of a karmic seed right before it ripens and is born. What brings about this fully ripened karmic seed named becoming? The ninth link is grasping or clinging. It refers to grasping at sensual pleasure or various wrong views, including the view of eternalism, that there is a soul or substantial person who goes from life to life. What is the cause of clinging? The eighth link is craving and refers to grasping, not only to pleasure, but to our belief in a solid self at the time of the death not wanting to be separated and then craving another body to take birth in. Craving and clinging are closely related. And one way they are described is that grasping is the strong increase of craving. So what is the cause of craving? The seventh link is feeling. And in the traditional illustration of the wheel of life, a painting of a man with an arrow in his eye represents the intensity with which feelings dominate our samsaric existence. Feelings are generally of three types, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And most of the time we're generating craving and grasping based on holding on to pleasant feelings or rejecting unpleasant feelings. So the seventh link of feeling is where is one place um, where a person really has a good opportunity to actually break the chain of the 12 links between feeling and craving. So when we notice a feeling arising, instead of immediately instinctively reacting with craving, with mindfulness, we can notice, oh, that's a feeling. It's pleasant or it's unpleasant or it's neutral. And then we can not react. And we can think about the three characteristics of all conditioned phenomenon. First, they are in the nature of suffering when we grasp at them. Second, they are impermanent, arising and passing away in each moment. And third, they are selfless or empty of inherent existence. So these are all liberating insights that instead of leading to renewed birth and samsara, lead to nirvana or the cessation of suffering. Where does feeling arise from? The sixth link is contact and refers to the moment when one of our six sense faculties sometimes called the six sources, makes contact with its corresponding object. So the eyes and visual objects, the nose and odors or fragrances, the ears and sounds, the tongue and tastes, touch and perception and physical objects. Sorry, touch perception and physical objects. 
And lastly, the mind and thoughts. So, um, you know, here you can see we're really kind of slowing down our process of awareness and kind of breaking it down into little chunks, which, um, uh, you know, ordinarily uh, our mind is just moving so quickly that we don't really see what's happening. Um, so this, this is a way of slowing it down and noticing, you know, we turn and we look and we see something and something connects with our eye sense consciousness. And then, and then something happens in our mind. Um, and, and same with all the other sense doors. Contact depends upon these six sense sources or bases and uh, contact is, oh, sorry, um, the sixth length is contact and these six sense sources or bases are the fifth link. And the fourth link is name and form. Form refers to the body and name refers to the four mental aggregates. So this is getting down to a really much more kind of foundational level of our psychophysical um, being. Um, so, the, so the body is form and then the four mental aggregates are feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness. So we've already discussed feeling Discrimination or perception or recognition is the mental factor of identifying objects. You know, we look and we see, oh, that's a person I know over there, or, or that's, that's uh, chocolate over here. You know, we just, we can identify things and label them. <laughs> Compositional or volitional factors refers to mental factors such as will, intention and motivation and consciousness refers to awareness itself which is described as clarity and knowing in the traditional depiction of the wheel of life uh, this name and form link we see a painting of a rowboat being rowed by an oarsman with passengers so here i'm going to quote from venerable tipton Chodron from a teaching Given in the early 90s that I was probably present for, but not paying enough attention, name and form is represented by the boat, or its person and passengers. The boat is the body. The passengers and the oars person are the different mental aggregates. We're going across the sea of samsara in the currents of birth, aging, sickness, and death. When we're born into a new body, it is represented by this new boat. This is the vehicle that will take us from this life to the next life. It's also the vehicle through which we experience all the happiness and unsatisfactory experiences of this life. So name and form represents both the psychophysical aggregates as they develop in the mother's womb and the basis for any sensory experiences during our lives. So you can see there's a lot of overlap and fluidity to all these concepts. Um, and with study and reflection, we can piece it together and make sense of the puzzle of our existence. But most of the time, you know, if we're not paying attention, our minds are just on autopilot and we don't question our experience or try to understand the process of how our mind influences our reality. So the third link is called consciousness, but it has a specific meaning different from the general term of consciousness, which is one of the five aggregates. Here it refers to a sp specific consciousness that links one life to the next and maintains the continuity of an individual's awareness. It is also divided into two parts, the consciousness at the time of the cause, when we plant a karmic seed, and the consciousness at the time of the result, 
when that karmic seed ripens and is experienced. The second link is called karmic formations or formative actions and mainly refers to the intention which creates karma. So remember karma simply means action, but the most powerful actions in terms of karma first begin in the mind. So I'm just gonna read another passage here from Buddhism, one teacher, many traditions. Formative actions may be meritorious or virtuous, demeritorious or non-virtuous, or unwavering, leading respectively to fortunate rebirths and unfortunate rebirths in the desire realm and rebirth in the form and formless realms. Formative actions generate rebirth into a new existence by serving as the condition for the consciousness that takes birth. This occurs in two ways. First, during our lives, we create karma when we think, speak, and act. These intentions occur along with consciousness and also affect consciousness. Second, at the time of death, previous karma is activated and propels the consciousness through the death process into a new existence. Formative actions determine whether this new consciousness is one of a human, animal, and so forth, corresponding with the body it has entered. Karma accumulated in previous lives also determines which environment we are born into, the situations we experience, our habitual tendencies, and the feeling we experience. While previous karma influences consciousness, in general, it is not an unalterable determining force. At any moment in our waking lives, we have the potential to change the course of our lives by changing our intentions. What does karma depend upon? Karma depends upon the first link, which is ignorance. Ignorance refers to not understanding the Four Noble Truths or dependent arising, and also the grasping at inherent existence. That is the root of karmic formation, which keeps us locked in samsara until we complete, completely remove ignorance. One of the challenges to gaining a deep understanding of the 12 links is that due to the conventions of language, they are described in sequential order, so either in reverse order or forward order. But in reality, that sequence is only relevant to one particular karma. And while the karma of this birth relates to one particular karmic seed, there are many other karmic sequences occurring simultaneously, ripening countless possible future births in samsara. And these links aren't just sequential but interact in many different ways. So, um, so to give an example of how these 12 links fit together in the context of one mind stream, the current life would be viewed as being the result of the ignorance and karma created in a previous life, which then resulted in the pre present life's experience or resultant consciousness, name and form, six sense sources, contact and feeling. So that's all in this, in this life. And then going forward in this life, when we experience feeling that leads to craving, clinging and becoming, that creates, um, that leads to another rebirth in samsara where birth, aging and death again result. You still with me? <laughs> um, so, so that's what we just reviewed is what is called the afflictive side of the 12 links, which describe how we remain in samsara and experience suffering. Jeremy, you'll be happy to uh, know that it's also what's called a purified side where we emphasize that by ending, that by ending ignorance, karma is ended and each subsequent 
link is ended and thereby ending the whole cycle and achieving liberation. So I used to get really confused when some of my teachers would say that the purpose of Buddhist practice is to end birth. It sounds quite nihilistic on the surface, but what I think it actually means is that we're trying to end birth in the context of birth under the influence of ignorance. So for example, bodhisattvas who have realized emptiness can still take birth in the world and do, but they're guided by their wisdom and their altruistic intention to work for the benefit of others. They appear to take birth and have senses and feelings and so forth, but these aren't normal beings and their actions are, are no longer influenced by ignorance or if there is some ignorance, it's very, very slight. Um, are we doing in time? Maybe I'll stop there. I was, I could go a little bit more, but um, that's that's a lot. So, um, uh, you know, I've I've read a couple of books on this subject, and are you know, and it's always kind of a bit confusing, and some of the terminology is, is a bit nebulous, and sort of like, well, you know, why is feeling here in the seventh link, but I hear about it again in the fourth link, and um, so there's two, two thoughts come to mind is, is one, you know, this is all, um, translated, um, uh, I mean, the original Buddhist texts were written in Sanskrit and then the Lam Rim is, um, written in Tibetan and now it's translated in English. So, you know, there's a little bit of, um, challenge there in, in going from one language to another. Um, and, you know, it, it's just one of those teachings that uh, it's important to have faith and keep um, chewing. Uh, it's like you're trying to eat bone soup, you know, you have to keep chewing the bones. <laughs> To, uh, I mean, this is not a good vegan analogy, so I don't use, have any bones in my diet anymore. <laughs> but the the masters always talk about chewing on bones, and um, so um, and and have having the faith that you're planting really positive seeds that create the merit that eventually enable us to understand the teachings. You know, it's. I mean, I might be at. I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand all this stuff yet, but every, every time I look at it, I get a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more awareness opens up. And, and so, um, it makes sense. And that's, that's why I keep studying it because, um, <clears throat> actually yesterday I went to, uh, dinner at some other people's house and, and their in-laws were there, and I spent most of my time talking to the to the the parents of my friends um, who were in their seventies and kind of slightly different generation, and um, and uh, I'm not I'm not I don't often go out to these sorts of social gatherings, so it's been a long time since I've you know kind of interacted in that context, and I real I realized wow I. I'm, I'm less confused about who I am and how I should interact. You know, I'm just, I just want to listen to people and understand who they are. And, and I don't need to like prove anything or, or make a, uh, make a big show of my ego, you know, about anything who I am. And so it's like, I think that's all the blessings of, of Buddhist practice. So, um, Thoughts, questions, sharings. Um, love to love to hear from you. Can you expand a little bit on birth under the influence of ignorance? Um. Yeah. So. Um. You know, as long as we have 
as long as we haven't removed the ignorance, and I'm not talking about like um, normal ignorance, I'm talking about the ignorance that uh, uh, believes in inherent existence of the self. We see ourselves as solid, and that's and, and inherently existent, truly existent, existing from our own side. I mean, if we look and try to um, understand that logic, you know, and analyze, we can see that it's not true. You know, the person that we call I, that's Shane or Jordan or Jeremy, you know, we exist based on causes and conditions, you know, our parents met and fell in love and, and then we come along and, you know, our food, all the food we ate caused us to grow and the teachers we met in our lives gave us knowledge. You know, these are all causes and conditions that create the people who we are today. And, and we also depend upon, you know, we're not this solid, kind of obelisk, you know, that we sometimes think we are, you know, we have parts, you know, we have physical parts, we have mental parts, you know, different aspects of our awareness. And, and ultimately at the deepest level of dependence, we depend upon what's called conceptual imputation, you know, um, or just simply name, um, you know, who is the person that exists behind the name? Who were we before somebody named you Shane or Jeremy, you know, like, and, and does that act of naming, did that really change anything that suddenly you come into being when somebody gave you a name? No, of course not. You know, you, you, uh, you're much more subtle and complex and fluid than simply a name. And so, um, so when we analyze, we see all those things, but in our normal daily waking life, we don't question our uh, appearances, our, our self as, you know, we look at ourselves in the mirror and, and we, we say, oh, I have, it's a bad hair day. I'm, I'm gonna be really embarrassed or, um, you know, this, this feeling of a solid eye, that's, that's the root form of ignorance and it leads to concretizing our view of all other things and people and and so that's that's the source of all the negative karma uh, and even virtuous karma too you know it, it's it's even when we have even when we create virtuous karma as long as it's under the influence of ignorance we're still solidifying this sense of an eye, you know, oh, I did a really good thing, you know, I'm going to get some good karma. And, and um, so the ignorance, until we remove this fundamental ignorance through the process of, of doing deep analysis and then single pointed meditation, where we realize the truth, not just intellectually, but directly in, in a, what's called a yogic direct perception, you know, you're in deep meditation, you're not, you're not thinking, you're not conceptualizing. The thoughts and the conceptions help to get us to that place, but then we have to let go of the thoughts and conceptions and rest in the, the actual awareness. Um, I don't know how to describe that actual transition, but um, so that's that's the process of removing ignorance, and once once we do that, then we've broken this cycle of the twelve links. Thank you. I think I got that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm still working on it too. I I got all the words so at ninety percent now, but uh, I'm still working on it too. <laughs> it still kind of confuses me the way they all sort of work together, you know. Um, it would help if I had a visual. I like the visual of the wheel of life, but I don't have it. Um, I mean, some of these books have really good diagrams, and and I really um, just 
gave a brief, very brief, probably flawed presentation of it that, that I'm sure I've made mistakes in my explanation. I mean, I'm maybe not major ones, but maybe, I don't know. I, I did my best, but um, yeah, it, it helps to diagram it out. Think about what the different links represent. There's, there's another uh, teaching on how some links are suffering and some are karma. It is complex. So hang in there, keep going. <laughs>